Well, hey everyone, it's Marcus, and I am sitting down via Zoom today with an Australian freaking music legend. He is Mark Lazot, um, known as Diesel also. Mark, how are you? I'm good, Marcus. Awesome. Oh, we have a good day there. Um, happy um, week to you as we lead into Christmas. Um, the chaos has all started, hasn't it? How's your life? Um, yeah, I, I feel like it started in November this year, which was a bit like, whoa, what's going on? Like, you know, it's like when the hot cross buns come out too early, yeah, it just yeah. kind of throws you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I, you know, um, I feel like they're going to, they're trying to like put out the decorations now in late October or something. Oh my God. It's all about making that money. Um, now, excitedly, you have got your 16th um, studio album, which is called uh, Bootleg Melancholy. Um, 16 albums, studio albums. That's huge. Um, how excited. Do you still find the excitement, like 16 times rounds now, do you still find the excitement of bringing out a new album for everyone to listen to? Yeah, it's it's, it's one of those numbers that's just like, what? You know, it's, yeah. I, it's not tangible to me. Uh -huh. um, but it's it it's gives me some kind of feeling of like that I've been busy like I haven't been like um too lazy, <laughs> but then when I do the division on like how many years I've, I've you know been making records and it's like hey, yeah I've, actually I could probably could have squeezed a few more in, <laughs> um, but yeah you know I I still get the same um it's it's a bit like when you've got to take something to school that you've made like a project or something and, and put it in front of the whole class and you're making it at home and you're all really excited. And then you, that morning you realize, Oh God, I hope it's good enough. You know, that whole, that feeling of like terror, it, it's, it is no other word for it. There's, there's a, there's a feeling that I get before I release a record and it's, it's also like very personal. Um, and suddenly it's not, which is exciting. I love I love it, but I'm also yeah a little a little kind of like still, um, just yeah, bef befuddled by it. You know, it's like, what's it going? What, what? How are they going to receive it? How are they going to interpret that lyric or whatever it is? Yeah. So there's still a bit of wonder even after 16 albums. It's not just like make album, put it out. You know. <laughs> Did it ever like that for you? Do you felt in the beginning? Um. In the, in the beginning, how it felt. Yeah. Did you feel like that in the beginning, that it was just a process, um, you know, because of record companies, et cetera? No, the, in the beginning, it was kind of dogmatic, though, I have to say. It was very, it was kind of dogmatic because I didn't really know about the process that much. And I was, you know, full tilt into like a live kind of head and doing, doing shows in front of people and trying to get people to come to the shows. And then all of a sudden, we, you know, we get thrown into a room with no audience and one man, you know, like um, behind the glass. And it was like, what's this? It's a studio. It's where you record. Oh, this doesn't, this doesn't look like much fun, <laughs> you know? And, you know, I quickly kind of like got over that. I, when I say quickly, it, it, you know, it took me yeah, a couple of albums. And then I realized that the, the, the fun and the beauty is in the fact that you're not, you know, in front of an audience, it's, it's, it's a place where you can, you know, like treat it like a laboratory. We can experiment and, and cook up things and try things. And um, yeah, a, a place of discovery where you don't have the pressure of like, come on, I've got to do this gig, you know, like, you know, it, it's on a schedule sort of thing. Um, but yeah, the only thing back then was there was a, there was a clock ticking and it was called the, you know, the budget of the album clock, which, you know, it was a very real clock. You were allowed this much time and you had to finish it by then. And, you know, it's probably a good thing because we've all heard those stories about albums that have just had no time constraints, like, you know, that have like gone on for literally years and they're still not finished. You know, the yeah. second Guns N' Roses album comes to mind. Um, but yeah, like you need, you need, I think I've got this theory that you, whatever time it takes, like if you've given this so much time, you'll get it done. You know, and if you're given that much time, you use it all. <laughs> but if someone says you got to do this in five minutes, you'll get it done. You know, so that, yeah, there's all of those kind of thought processes. And yeah, at first I, I it was all a very strange thing because it felt so ster sterile and 
you know, you're trying to make this music that's really exciting and has energy and everything. And, and it's all going to come out of um, essentially two speakers. Um, you know, we've got two ears until that changes. And, um, you know, a lot of people are listening to music on like Sonos speakers and things that are like, you know, not that traditional two speaker thing. But when you're working in the stereo environment, which is what we work in left and right, which a lot of people listen to with earbuds now, that is still your canvas to work with. So you've really got to make whatever it is that you're doing, you need to work within that canvas. And yeah, you find out that, you know, for instance, like I want a really big guitar sound. So you, you wheel in all the really big, loud th- amps, you know, and lots of speakers make a wall of sound. And then you put the mic in front of that and you expect that to, well, I did, I expected it to translate into like miniature, you know, into the realm of the, 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 the speakers. And it doesn't always. And so I learned things like that because a lot of the really big guitar sounds, you know, like a Led Zeppelin guitar sound or, or ZZ Top, you know, they were done on tiny, tiny amps. So yeah, those, a lot of rules just don't apply that rules that are on stage. A lot of the same things with arrangements too. Um, like before our first record, the producer, we, we, we arrived in Memphis and, you know, we, we were told that there was going to be some rehearsals and pre-production, but it, it just kind of went, yeah, whatever. You know, we just thought we were going to march straight into the studio and we marched straight into this guy's garage and the outskirts of Memphis. And this garage was painted with like this foam that you spray onto the walls and it just turns it into this, what I call the anti, anti matter. Like there's no, there's absolutely no ambience, like absolutely probably what space sounds like. So everything that you play or sing or do is so unattractive and so unflattered by any, there's just no ambience whatsoever. And so, and so, yeah, we're playing in this room and going, we sound awful, you know, it sounds like crap you know, I hate this song, you know, and then he started ripping all our songs apart and um, taking all the bits that we thought were really interesting that we've been playing live. And we, it was like, wait, hang on. We, we, what? Oh no, we like that bit. And he was like, nah, trust me. He didn't even say, trust me. He just went, nah, I'm not doing it. And you know, our songs all got like, not, not crazy, but he, he trimmed a lot of stuff. He also extended things that were like surprising. It's like, Oh, you want to do that bit twice. Okay. And then in the grand scheme of things, you know, no one had done that with my songs before it, it's called arrangement, you know, and historically speaking, like we're talking like 50s, 60s, and even into the seventies, you'd see all these major records, you know, whether it's Shunny, Sonny and Cher or Frank Sinatra, or whoever or they had written by performed by produced by arranged by there's like, there was people that just, that's all they did was take people's songs and make them into you know, it's like you give them a bunch of flowers. You go, these flowers are, flowers are pretty, but if I do this, even even prettier. You know, it, it's a good song is a you know, can be a great song with with a really good arrangement. It's all about how you arrange the parts, and um, you know, like you take a song like Kylie um, that Kathy Dennis wrote, "Can't Get You Out of My Head." I mean, that's all choruses. Every part is a chorus. You know, which is mind blowing. But the way it's arranged, you know, I. I you know, I don't think you could have made a mess of that song, but the arrangement is, is like, it's, it's like, well, I'm pretty sure that they have used it as a study in music, music schools. It's like, check this arrangement out. Yeah. So yeah, we learned a lot of that stuff and um, yeah, it was kind of boot camp. And, and I guess I, I was one of those people straight away of people wondering why I, you know, this last record, I produced it, I mixed it, I mastered it. I did everything myself. I played, you know, everything on it, blah, blah, blah. You know, some people when they start off recording, they realize very, very soon that like they don't, they don't want to deal with the equipment. They don't want to know any. They just want to make their music. They want to write. They want to go in there, and they just not, not interested in that. Like just not, you know, just glaze over. I was the opposite. I, I wanted to know how it all worked straight away, and that that's the kind of that's like the eight year old me coming out because when I was eight, you know, I used to get two boom boxes and try to make, you know, multi recordings using two, two cassette decks, you know, going from one to the other. And it's funny. I found out that, um, uh, Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters did exactly the same thing and probably hundreds and thousands of, of other musicians. Um, but yeah, I was attracted to the nerd, the nerd side of it straight away. And, then the next albums that followed that I, you know, I think by solid state rhyme, which was, yeah, my third proper full studio album, I, I was, I was producing, um, not engineering so much because at that point we were still using like, you know, big tape machines and big consoles and everything. And, 
it was the advent of, you know, miniaturization and, and, you know, making music on laptops. It was really a revolution for me. It allowed me to really like become really self-sufficient. It's incredible. Mark, let's stay in the early days just for the moment. When we go back to the you know nineteen late nineties, sorry, no, the late eighties kind of period, uh, who were some of the idols that you were really looking up to at the time before you know you had your first album come out? Um, look, you know, I was listening to a lot of soul at that point. Uh, Otis Redding, James Brown, you know, um, going to Memphis was a real you know, that was just like a, an education, like going, that was my college education. I learned about the staple singers, you know, I learned about Albert King. I learned about all those Memphis artists that were real Memphis artists out, you know, Al Green, of course. And um, that was, yeah. And then back in Australia, like, you know, I could, it's really easy just to go, oh, pub rock, you know, pub rock was a phenomenon. But yeah, it, you know, it really was because living in Perth at that time as a teenager, my parents had moved all over the world and, you know, back and forth, Arizona, Rhode Island, you know, Albury, blah, 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 where they finally settled in Perth. And Perth had a, a you know, a, a, just a ridiculously active pub scene, mostly cover bands, but all the interstate touring bands would come through. And I, a lot of the times the band that I was in at the time before my first band, um, and the injectors was was a band called Innocent Bystands, which had a singer and a songwriter, and I was just kind of playing guitar and singing singing a little bit. Um, and he was, you know, old a lot older than me, and and really kind of nurtured me. And he was my kind of mentor. And we met through the Sunday papers. Um, his name was Brett Keyser, and we supported a lot of these bands. We supported Midnight Oil, um, the Divinals. Uh, roast, tat roast tattoo. Oh, most of them were at this gig in, in Perth called the Old Melbourne Hotel in the middle of the city, and it just was like such an experience to be, you know, watching these bands that had really, you know, they were like really, you know, riding this this wave. The, the touring scene was so big. Um, there were trucks, you know, out on the road. There was so many crew. There was lighting. There was, you know, there was, it was a big industry back then. And now most of it is, is in-house, which is great. It's a lot safer. That's one thing, you know, people talk about the old days and how great it was and everything. It's like, yeah, it was, it was cool. But you know what? It's a lot safer now. Like crew, crew back then had to do overnighters and trucks and stuff and just terrible. And, you know, yeah, sadly people did die. You know, they, they, it just has to be said, it, you know, people have no idea, um, I think going in the army and, and going overseas and to faraway lands and fighting wars is, is a lot more dangerous. You know, that's an obvious thing to say, but being in the music industry back then was pretty effing dangerous. It, it really was like just the, the dangers of not getting enough sleep, um, the roads back then, everything. And, you know, the tours were booked. It's like they'd look at the map and go, Mildura. Brisbane, yeah, you can do that. You know, <laughs> like, twelve hours, it's easy. Yeah, no, throw sleep. the dark. <laughs> and uh, well, it's it's doable. You know, like you know, it's definitely drivable. Yeah, if you have like a changing crew that like rotates every like eight hours, which no one had. So yeah, I mean, I I, I caught the very very end of that, Marcus. It was um, a lot of when we got to Sydney, people were going, "Oh, too bad you came." You know, now it was so much better 10 years ago. And I was like, well, it looks pretty good still. You know, and they're like, no, no, you have no idea. There was a thing called the Bondi Lifesaver and there was this and there was that and all these gigs that, that had, you know, the Coman Cutter and all these really infamous gigs, you know, bands were like places where like Chisel used to play on a Tuesday night, you know, stuff like that. And somehow we'd, we'd, caught, we'd missed all that because even in Sydney back then, um, the pub, scene was winding down you know it was gentrification was 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 kicking off well and truly <laughs> so yeah i mean I, I i look at all that that time and, and just think i'm glad i caught a little bit of it you know i'm really glad and um yeah i've sort of survived all of those changes and and morphed you know the, the how the industry morphs and changes and yeah to 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 now you know streaming and um yeah that that pub scene is kind of like a a tiny little boutique version of itself but thankfully we have things like theaters and um and lots of really cool really well curated festivals i don't think the festival scene was 
anything like that back then. It was like, there was a few like, you know, this like Australian made, things like that, that, that would happen, but it wasn't a culture like the festival scene um, is now in Australia. So much so that, you know, before COVID people were saying it's too, it needs to wind down a bit. It's saturated, there's too many festivals. So sadly we lost, lost a few, but you know, it's probably not a bad thing because it was just saturated too many. Hey, before we move on to the future too far, just at the moment, let's go back to 1989 still, um, when um, Johnny Diesel and the Injectors album came out, you know, somewhat self-titled. Um, it was essentially a hits factory, that album, wasn't it? There was, you know, Soul Revival, I Don't Need yeah. Love, um, Cry in Shame. Um, when I'm... that album just, exp- and, I mean, it did explode. It, it was huge. Um, how did you feel at the time? Were you like, wow this is just like nothing i even imagined for the first it was time. Kind of, i mean it was kind of just like hold on just hold on and it was a wild ride and then we got very brought down to earth when we 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 went <laughs> we went <laughs> we yeah we did a lap around the country it was it was pretty hysteria you know hysteria was would be a word i'd reuse um and uh then we popped overseas and Europe was just fantastic. It really was playing in the town and country, selling it out in London, doing, you know, Copenhagen and Germany. Those are all really strong markets. Then we got to America and it was just, just like, <laughs> so, so the opposite. That's all I can say. Um, we really hit the reality of a rock and roll band. Um, yeah, I say rock and roll because, you know, it was, we were playing like a, a 50s kind of blues tinged rock but it had a modernity about it but you have to understand that in 1989 this is before the chili peppers and nirvana t- to name you know only two of the big wave of bands that were about to come and flush the whole spandex thing down the drain it, this that hadn't happened yet so we got to america looking kind of like the clash that's that was my that was my goal you know it was like if we were going to have a, a a band that we wanted to sort of like model ourselves. Well, that was my goal. I was, I wanted to look like Joe Strummer. Um, and yeah, we just didn't have that MTV look. So that was, you know, it's hard to imagine, but it was a real problem. The record company would, was saying things to our management or publicists. Yeah, they're really great. But you know, if only they uh, looked more like this, you know, and sh- showing a picture of like poison or something and we're like, well, you know, sorry, but you know, we're really good. We're loud. You know, we play really loud. Um, and yeah, that was another thing. I remember playing in a, in a gig in outside of Detroit and the, the support band, like they had these big fake facades of, of amps, um, scrims, they call them. And behind they had tiny little amps and, you know, the audience were all up front doing, you know, being respectful and everything. And, um, they were called house of Lords. That was nice guys, really nice guys. They finished. Then we got, came on and, you know, pushed our actual lamps on stage, you know, loud. Um, and the crowd just like looked at us and we're like, that doesn't look like MTV and thought it was just too loud and too Australian for them. And off they went, they went, and it was a really good crowd. And they just all went to the back of the room and played in where the pool tables were just abs. I've never in my, I hope I never have to experience that again, but absolute just um, complete rejection right there on the spot. It was like, but yeah, it was, it was really, I mean, it was, we were in what they say, you know, trailer trash, white trash, um, suburbia. It really was, it was pretty sad, pretty sad area. Um, to, and they, um, in hindsight, great to experience the roller coaster. Oh, absolutely. It, it, that was a quick, really quick education and, and, um, you know, success. I love saying this because I've only just like read it a couple of, like maybe it was just, uh, the last record, Sunset Suburbia, uh, a journalist wrote a really great review about the record and um, just said, you know, said that I'd, you know, had success and survived. He survived success. I was like, what do you mean survive? I've never thought of it. It's like, yeah, success is something you have to actually survive. <laughs> it's not, it's not just something that you get and you go, okay, I've got success. I'm just going to put it in this drawer over here. Um, cool. Tick tick box i've got success you know it it's it, it's well num- number one it's fleeting and number two you have to survive it yes it, it it will give you some rewards of course but 
yeah, it's like, great, you're successful, survive it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Hey, let's yeah. lead on up to obviously the 16th album, which is, like I said, bootlegged melancholy. What's been the inspiration for this new album? And the new. Well, I found myself, um, I think a lot of people too, because we, we were talking about it. There was even some really funny things on TikTok, like someone had made um, <laughs> with a, with a um, treadmill in their house. They'd put like pictures of like like Rome or something, and they were like pretending that they were like traveling. <laughs> and just you know, I had it had me in stitches, you know, and I found myself, um, yeah, having very privileged. I, I have to say, very privileged daydreams of like, oh God, I really miss you know, I miss New York, or I miss I miss going there, or I miss being there, and and you know. I miss Japan, you know, like all these places that I love to go. Um, and because, yeah, I was stuck in a, you know, we were all, we were all stuck in some kind of thing. And my, you know, my thing was, I wouldn't call it a hell by any means. I've got a beautiful park across the road for me. I had a place where I could run every day with, at, with not see a soul just up and down this one street, um, which funny enough is where all the trucks for a lot of the big um, staging and lighting and everything that for the, that do all the really big concert tours is literally in the street next to me. And that was kind of an eerie feeling of uh, like, um, normally I would go past there and I'd see the, 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 the things open and then trying out the laser lights and they've got smoke machines going on. It was closed. The trucks were just sitting there getting cobwebs on them. And it was like, wow, this industry is really shut down. <laughs> you know, uh, I, yeah, I think the, First time I saw one of those trucks rolling, like it gave me this like feeling inside. It was like, oh yes, we're you know it's back, you know. But yeah, I, I found myself just up working in the studio space that I'm in right now, and just just thinking about where I've been, and yeah, lamenting my my amazing life that I feel that I've had, and and then it, that turned into like writing whole kind of like little essays on on these little experiences um yeah and, and you know it's the first time i'd ever done a zoom writing session which i did with um angus and it was yeah angus gill and we we wrote something about my dad's traveling because we were talking about you know you wanted to know where i'd come from and i said my dad was was wild he, he we, we went back to america and arrived in san francisco he bought a car and just drove east into the desert pretty much and didn't know where he was going or tell us where we were going. We were just in the back seat wondering what's going on. He was like, what? And I said, yeah, he just, he just bought a car and headed towards Nevada where we knew we had some friends, but we knew we weren't going to stay in Nevada. And then we just kept driving. And then he ended up in Arizona because he saw this little town and thought this is a cool town. And, and, and that was it. It was literally just um, totally like just, yeah, balls out, you know, just like, <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, pretty. I love it. Pretty um, hey, let's talk about the. I've just been alerted on my screen that we've got nine minutes left before it cuts out on us. Um, let's talk about the Forever Tour, which is going to be going around Australia in 2024. Um, what can your diehard fans and your new fans expect from this show? Well, um, the Forever Tour is, I, I think it's probably the most arguably the most encompassing show that I've done. I feel like I'm getting to so sort of like deep chasm, like chasms of my catalog. Um, and it's just, I think the theater environment has really helped me do that. The only, the only sad thing is, is well, I don't know if it's sad, but I, I, I have no support on this, which I love having support acts because I love supporting yeah, and they support me and I love supporting them and getting them an audience and the people exposing, but I need all the time I can get. So I'm, I do two sets. I use up all the time. I'm a, I'm a total hog and uh, people get, yeah, a, a first set and then a little break and then another set. So they get an awful lot of, <laughs> they, they, they go home just like exhausted. I, I, that's the idea. And they're like, I'll wear them out, you know, in a good way. And yeah, it's a really, I, I'm usually not happy if I don't get to really be like, you know, get to the very, 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 like every nook and cranny of, of what I do every night. Um, you know, except if it's like a special event where you just get on and do like one song and it's a big thing and yeah, that's exciting and everything, but I'm, I'm more of a fan of, you know, like, 
yeah, like really ringing it out. And that's what, that's the background I've come from. So the theater is, is a really beautiful place to do that. So yeah. And yeah, it's, it's with each record, um, another addition to the family and you kind of make room and it's, it's just like, uh, yeah, another, another, I don't know what the analogy is, but it's really nice to have another color on, on the palette and, 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 and just see how um, I've started playing a few of the songs live and just to see how they are next to other songs that I've played thousands of times. That's, that's always really interesting seeing how they play with the, with their, with their siblings. <laughs> so it's like meet your brother or your sister, you know, <laughs> um, I think so. Mark, I mean, your stories are incredible. Do you do you find that when you're on stage, you do a bit of storytelling as well? Well, that's something I forgot to t- talk about. Yes, I never used to say much at all. In fact, um, people always are surprised. Some people aren't surprised. They go, "Yeah, I remember you were terrified." You did, but some people are like, "What? You know, but you look so confident." It's like, yeah, I was confident with the music, but when I first started, I I was like. You know, I'd say like two two words, and that was really hard. And now I've gone, I wouldn't say I've gone to the point where, you know, if you've ever been to a John Farnham gig, God bless, but he is such an amazing singer, but he's a really great conversationalist as well. <laughs> like the way he just like unravels stuff in front of the audience. Um, I don't go to quite that thing, but I do enjoy just being really like, um, yeah, I feel like as soon as they get this feeling of me being, a human like i know that sounds ridiculous it's like well clearly i am um but as soon as i humanate humanize myself um in front of them or humiliate depending on how, how <laughs> the night's come <laughs> um the, the night just starts off good on a good foot you know what i mean and i usually like, i usually do that straight after some t- the other night i surprised myself i was like geez man you really relaxed tonight the, the other voice in my head you know and I started talking before I'd even done he'd sung one song. And that's so not like me. But every song, like every song has something behind it. Like if I talk about Don't Need Love and talk about how I was working in a convenience store in Connecticut doing the midnight to dawn, that was a crazy ride, you know, working midnight to dawn shifts in a convenience store, gas station, you know. Yep. And I'd get so cranked up on the on the free coffee and donuts and come home and I tried to sleep during the day and it was just a terrible experience to my, the house would be empty because my sister and sister and a brother-in-law would be at work and I'd have this house in the woods in Connecticut by myself. And, and I, and I was living on in, in this little room where my grandma used to be when she got older and um, before she, they had to put her in the, the care home and I'm sitting on grandma's bed and I'm got my guitar and I've just done a, a, a night shift. And yeah, that's where the songs, you know, that was all I could do was just like, like write and like most of the first album I, I wrote like sitting on my grandmother's bed after doing night shifts. So things like that, it's, you know, it's people don't like, how else are they going to know that? Exactly. You know, Tell them where it's all come from. Hey, I could yeah. literally talk to you all day. The stories are fascinating. It's absolutely incredible. Um, our clock is ticking. We've got literally three minutes to wrap up. I can't believe right. it. These bloody budget, um, basic <laughs> Zoom calls. I should upgrade, then I've got forever. But um, hey, um, Mark, it has been an absolute pleasure. Um, obviously, the tour in 2024. You are coming to Adelaide, which is so exciting, and you're going to be playing the Dunstan Playhouse at the Adelaide Festival Centre. Mm-hmm. Pretty cool. Something different. Um, and that is February the 24th. I am going to be there. I can't wait to catch up with you. Um, I'll come and try and sneak backstage, get past the bouncers. Um, oh, you, you look like um, a, you look like you belong on stage, so it shouldn't be too hard. Yay! <laughs> um, Mark, absolute pleasure. I look forward to seeing you. Um, have a fabulous Christmas. Be safe yes. and be kind, and I'll see you in 2024. Thanks, Marcus. Cheers.